Grit. We have been talking the last several weeks about grit, and man, we need some grit today, don't we? Good grief, it just keeps coming. The grit, I've defined grit based of all the, all the things we've talked about. This is the way we're going to define grit. Grit is passionately and persistently standing firm in our pursuit of Christ. Passionately and persistently standing firm in our pursuit of of Christ. And we've, that is not easy to do in the world we live in today. We might be able to get the passionate part down, but eventually that passion runs out and the standing firm wavers because it just seems like we're constantly being hit from every angle. You think you have something figured out and you think you know a good, safe place to stand and then something happens that shakes you up and then you're going, ah, maybe I didn't have it figured out and maybe that wasn't the safe place for me to stand and we end up moving to some other spot and and taking on some different thoughts or ideas or understandings of what's going on around us and eventually that gets shaken. It's like constantly, one thing after the other, we're being shaken, and our foundation that we thought at one point was firm no longer is, and it's just, it's hard. And so we need to have grit. We need to passionately and persistently stand firm in our pursuit of Christ, no matter what is going on around us. No matter what is happening, we've got to make sure that that ground that we're standing on is Christ himself. Because then it doesn't matter what happens, that foundation stays. God stays. And we've got to stay with Him. As chaotic as everything else is around us, we have to stand firm on Christ. And so we started this series off talking about this this spirit of grit that God has given us. That He has given us this spirit of grit. We don't have a spirit of weakness, but we have a spirit of, of power, of love, and sound mind. We've been given this spirit of grit. And then Jesus displayed for us what it looks like to live in that grit, right? Jesus followed the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness, was tempted by the Spirit for 40 days, or fasted for 40 days, and then was tempted by the Spirit, and he just showed some tremendous grit. So so we've been given this spiritual grit, by the gift of the Holy Spirit. We've been given an example of grit by Christ, and He has promised to help us in that grit when we find ourselves struggling and unable to do it on our own. So we have all of this. And that's great knowledge to have, isn't it? That's a great thing to know. But then it's another thing to actually put it into practice and to begin to live it. As we learn, to, as we learn about this grit that we've been given... We've got to figure out what it looks like for us to start actually living in it. We've got, to, we've got to have a faith that's gritty. We've got to have a gritty faith. There's, and I think sometimes when it comes to having that gritty faith, faith is, is what? Believing and hoping for things that you can't see. So sometimes our gritty faith has to be based off of not what we're currently experiencing, and the circumstances around us, but on what we know. And what we know and what we believe might not always be, it's going to conflict sometimes with the things that we're experiencing. I'm going to talk about that more in here a second, but I experienced this firsthand. Have any of you ever played a virtual reality game? Yes, some of you have. Well, I was playing a virtual reality game uh, here not that long ago, and I was actually playing uh, miniature golf on this game. And I was playing with Dale Apple, if you, and you can ask him about it. So he was in a different, he was at home though. So we were playing in miniature golf, round of miniature golf, virtually, together in virtual reality. And so I could see this little moving head, and it was fun. And, and in virtual reality, there were like these cliffs on the golf course. And, and so it, what's weird is like when I first played it, I knew, I knew that I was standing in my living room, but like, it still was unnerving to like step off the cliff. It was weird how what you knew and what you were experiencing were two different things. Well, I got into this game of miniature golf with with Dale and we were talking and we we were playing and I'm way better at virtual miniature golf than I am real miniature golf. But there was railing in the virtual world and uh 
I forgot I was in the virtual world, I guess, because I went to lean on the railing and stumbled around. I didn't fall entirely, but I was like, hopefully nobody saw that. But Dale saw my little head wobble, and he started laughing because he was like, did you just fall? I was like, no. I don't know what you're talking about. But sometimes what's in our head and what's going on in the world around us, it just, it's hard to figure out. There was another game that I was playing where I actually got motion sick playing the game. I wasn't moving. I was, I was just standing still, moving my arms, but the way the virtual world was, it had me moving and I got motion sick because my head, my brain said, you're moving, but my body wasn't. So it was, it's weird. And I feel like when it comes to our faith that sometimes that's what happens. We've, we live in this world where things are appearing one way or going at it in one, one direction and our mind is telling us something else and we've got to hang on to this faith. This faith that we know we have that's got to lead us through these times we don't always understand. We've got to convince ourselves to live in this way. Gritty faith. A gritty faith holds on to what we know and what we believe. It's not based on how we feel or the circumstances we face. It's based on what we know. There's a story in Matthew chapter 15 of this lady who had gritty faith. And she had circumstances that would have dictated some different decisions to her, but she stuck with her faith, and she saw it through to victory. In Matthew 15, it says, Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word, and his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, Yes, Lord. But even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. There's some gritty faith where her faith is telling her one thing, but the circumstances are trying to force her into something else. And she sticks with her faith. I mean, let's, let's look at this. Look at what's going on in the story. So it says that she was a Canaanite woman. So she was a Gentile. She was not a Jew. And so to the Jews, Gentiles, anyone that wasn't a Jew, was unclean and unworthy. So she was unclean and unworthy simply because of her ethnicity, because of her race, because she wasn't a Jew. And they would refer to them as dogs. Not a friendly, cute little puppy kind of dog, but like a scroungy, dirty, stray dog that has no home. It wasn't meant to be a nice term. It was a derogatory term. So this Canaanite woman, this dog, comes to Jesus with this. So her her literal circumstance, the reality that she's in, is that she's someone who most Jews wouldn't even talk to, let alone a rabbi or a teacher. And so here she is with the audacity to show up and to try to talk to Christ, not just talk to him, but ask him to help her. She's a Gentile woman who has no business, according to this Jewish culture, even talking to him. When Jesus actually sent his disciples out in Matthew chapter 10, he actually said to them, don't go to the Gentiles, I just want you to go to the Jews. And so now here he is with this Gentile woman coming to him. What what an interesting set of circumstances for her to be facing. So right off the bat, she has two very good reasons to not even approach Jesus and to not even expect him to do anything for her if, he, if she does. She could have the boldness to approach him, but she has every reason to believe she, he'll, he'll totally ignore her because she's a Gentile woman. But this mom, this Gentile mom, has a daughter that is demon-possessed. 
horribly demon-possessed, probably being tormented and is in pain and agony, horribly demon-possessed. So this mom is going to do whatever she needs to do to get her daughter well. This is a good mom. This is a mom who's fighting for her daughter and knows that Jesus is there, and so she's going to go try and get her daughter healed by Christ. She's going to do whatever is necessary. She is passionate and persistent in the pursuit of healing of her daughter. She has got some grit, that's for sure. And when it comes to our kids, we have all probably got a little bit more grit than normal. So her grit didn't let her circumstances or her social status or the culture of the day stop her from passionately and persistently pursuing Jesus in this moment. And that raises the question with me and with all of us is, I want you to think for just a minute about the things that have stopped you from pursuing Christ. What are some of the reasons or excuses that you have used so that you didn't have to pursue Christ or so that you didn't feel like you should pursue Him, passionately pursue Him? Or what reasons have you given for not doing the things that God has asked you to do? What are those excuses for giving up too soon in certain fights or on certain things or dreams or goals in our life? This woman had two very big obstacles that she did not let get in her way because of her gritty faith. What kind of obstacles do we allow in our way and in between us and God because we just don't lack, we lack the grit to push through it because we're letting the circumstances dictate our faith instead of who God is. So she pushes through it. She's not settling with good enough. She's not settling with, well, I tried. She's not settling with, well, I'm, I'm a Gentile and there's no hope for me because Jesus isn't going to talk to me. That's not her attitude. She approaches Christ anyway. We have got to have that kind of grit. That no matter what culture tells us, no matter what social media tells us, no matter what the news tells us, no matter what people tell us, we've got to hold on to that truth of who God is. We've got to hold on to that faith that we have in Christ, and we have to keep going. Despite what's going on around us, even if it feels weird to take that step of faith, we've got to know and trust and believe the foundation that God has given us. So she takes that step of faith, and she approaches Christ. And the way she comes to Jesus, now I want you to pay careful attention to the way she takes that step and what she says. Because what she says says a lot about what she believes. It says a lot about the faith that she has. When she takes that step, she comes to Jesus with her demon-possessed daughter because she believes that he can truly set her free. She truly believed that. You wouldn't take that kind of risk if you didn't believe that the reward was greater than the risk. She truly believed that Jesus was capable of healing her daughter. So that's why she took that risk of being a Gentile woman and approaching a Jew, a Jewish rabbi, a popular Jewish rabbi at the time. So she's doing this because of her daughter, and because of what she believes. We've got to hold on to that same belief, that same grit. Maybe she heard stories about what Jesus had been doing, but either way, she believed he could do it. Do you believe God can do what you want him to do in your life? Do you believe God can give you the victory that you're after? Do you believe that God can give you the life that you're after? Do you believe that God can bring you the healing that you're after? Do you believe that today? Then keep believing that. No matter how many waves of COVID come, no matter what is going on in the world, no matter what government does or doesn't do, keep holding on to the fact that you believe God is bigger than all of it and God can do whatever God wants to do. Hold on to that faith. She held on to that faith, and she comes before him, and she calls him Lord. This Gentile woman calls Jesus Lord. That says a lot about who she believed Jesus to be. To call Jesus Lord, it was like this, this big confession of faith. 
It was this confession that was developed as being very sacred, even, in some of the earliest churches. So this title that, that she used and the stories that her actions said she believed, it was this, she understood who he was, like she got it. It was almost like she got it in ways that most of the Jews didn't get it. She got it in ways that everybody else was missing it. She was acknowledging Jesus as Lord. She believed that Jesus could heal her daughter. So this Gentile woman, though she's never met Jesus, has this tremendous amount of faith in him. And to her, he is Lord. He is, he is Lord. She is honoring him respecting him. She is in awe of him, and she fully believes in his power and in his sovereignty. And then she doesn't just stop with calling him Lord. She calls him the son of David, which was a distinctly Jewish designation. For the Messiah was the rightful king in the line of David. And so she's, she is this pagan Gentile woman making these bold declarations about who Christ was in the midst of these circumstances, in the midst of this culture that was telling her she should sit down and be quiet. And she is not going to sit down and be quiet. She is going to passionately stand and intercede for her daughter because she truly believes in who Jesus is and what he's capable of doing. That's gritty faith that will stand no matter what. And so she is standing, and she knows who she's talking to. And no matter what her head is telling her or what everybody around her is telling her, she's holding on to that faith. And that gritty faith is all she had. And, and that gritty faith oftentimes is all we're going to have. And what this story proves to me and proves to us is that that's all we need, is this gritty faith. That, that trusts completely and entirely in who God is and in who Jesus is and continues to walk in step with him. There are going to be times in the wilderness, there are going to be times in our life when we have to lean on what we know and what we believe and ignore the circumstances and even the feelings that come along with them and just trust in who Jesus is that he can give us freedom and healing and forgiveness and victory. And so she believes, truly believes all of this. This is the foundation that she's standing on. This is the source of her faith. This is the source of her grit. Just simply the circumstances seem to be overwhelming, but her faith is pushing her through. So she finally goes and she talks to, tries to talk to Christ, but what she faced with, the disciples now, some of Jesus' closest followers, are saying, Jesus, would you please shut this woman up and send her away? She's getting on our nerves. She, we're tired of listening to her. Get her out of here. Now, it's not real clear whether they were saying, give her what she wants and send her on her way, or if they were saying, ignore her and send her on their way. I don't know that they really cared at the moment. They were just tired of listening to this woman. I'm picturing this lady yelling at Jesus over the crowd, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. And she is screaming, and she's probably crying, and it's passion, and it's desperation, and it's grit, and no one's going to going to stop her and the louder they yell at her to be quiet and leave the louder she gets until finally they go to Jesus and say deal with this woman because she is annoying sometimes our faith needs to be annoying we've got to be gritty enough to be louder than the noise around us and we've got to get annoying so she she gets annoying they showed her no compassion and they, wanted, they acted like she didn't even matter. They just wanted her gone. How defeating would that have been? How defeating would that have been for you? You're coming to Christ because you believe that He's Lord. You're coming to Christ because you believe He has the power to do what you're asking Him to do. You believe all of that. 
You've come despite your circumstances. You're a Gentile woman. The culture tells you not to even bother, and you show up anyway. And now some of the people closest to Jesus are telling you to get out of here. How, what, how much? That's got to be defeating and exhausting. But she just pushes through with her gritty faith. How many times have we gotten to that point where, oh, man, I, the circumstances are hard, but I believe. And then we have people telling us we've lost our mind and we shouldn't. We shouldn't believe. You're crazy. God's not going to answer that prayer. God doesn't care about that. God isn't going to do that. Or, or we listen to something in our own heads, convincing ourselves that it's not going to happen, and we give up. I think most people in this woman's situation, when the disciples were telling her to be quiet and get out of here, probably she would have just thrown up her hands and said, all right, I've done enough. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. My throat hurts from screaming all this time. I'm just going to go home. I've tried. I've done all I can do. I've done more than most, so I'm just going to go. And to pile on top of this frustrating experience for her, Jesus doesn't even respond very positively. Jesus tells his disciples, I haven't come for her, I've come for the Jews. Which is what he said back in Matthew chapter 10. And here, I believe, is a, is a moment, an opportunity where he is cultivating some spiritual grit with her. He is bringing it out of her, right? He knows the faith that she has. So he's going to use her as an example. He's going to cultivate some, some grit in her and use this Gentile woman as an example of what faith should look like to all these Jews who weren't getting it. And so he just adds fuel to their fire. Oh, you're right, I didn't come for her. I came for the, for the Jews. And she keeps begging, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And then he goes so far as to even say, but it's not good to give the children's food to the dogs. That's horrible. I can't believe Jesus would say such a thing, right? That's insulting. If you get real into the Greek words, you, you'll see that the word Jesus used was a little bit of a nicer word. It was more of like a dog that's a pet that you liked, not trash that you threw out and was a stray dog that you was dirty and you didn't want anything to do with. So, so Jesus was a little bit nicer in what he said to her, but he was still calling her a dog. Granted, it was a, a family dog, a friendly dog. So have you been in these moments? Have you ever been in these moments where you feel like you're praying and you're crying out to God for mercy and you're crying out to God for answers or for change or for direction and you feel like God is just saying, I'm not going to answer you. I'm not going to give you what you're asking for. My answer is no, or my answer is not yet, or my answer is going to be different than what you think it's going to be. Or if we don't hear from him what we want. We don't hear from him what we expect. And that can get very frustrating and can be very defeating. And so I can only imagine how she was feeling in this moment. The disciples are trying to send her away. The circumstances are a barrier for her. But she believes that Jesus is Lord. She believes that he can heal her. So she keeps asking and she keeps begging until finally Jesus says, but I can't give the children's food to the dogs. And I love her response. I love her response. Her grittiness in her response is, yeah, well, the kids still let the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the table. Just to give me the crumbs. I don't need what you're giving the children. I just need what they don't want. And I believe that what they don't want is enough for you to heal my demon-possessed daughter. I'll take the leftovers just help me. Lord, have mercy on me. She believed that the crumbs from God's table were enough to give her what she was after. She didn't need the best. She just needed something from him. What an awesome, awesome testimony. That is gritty faith, where we show up 
believing who God is and saying, God, I need you, and I'll take whatever you give me, even the crumbs. Just give me the crumbs. She knows who her father is. She knows who can heal her daughter. She was persistent. There's a situation in Luke where Jesus is making a similar point. Well, not a similar point. He's making a point about being persistent in our prayer life. And in Luke chapter 11, he said, Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me from a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside he answers and says, Do not bother me. The door has already been shut and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will, not got, he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Sometimes we've got to have persistent faith. We've got to keep asking even though we hear no or we think we do. Even though we we encounter difficulties, we have to keep going. Gritty faith doesn't quit. Gritty faith just keeps asking. The neighbor didn't give his neighbor f- f- uh, bread because of his friendship. He did it because he got annoying. Let me give you some bread so you get out of here. Let me give you some bread so you can leave me and my family alone so we can get some sleep. This woman didn't give up in seeking the healing for her daughter that she desperately needed. She kept after it. She kept asking. The disciples were saying, give her what she wants because she's annoying, not because they had compassion for her. And Jesus finally does give her what she wants because she displays such a faith that he's never seen before. She believed the leftovers were enough. And so Jesus says, your faith is great. What you want has been done. And he heals her daughter. Gritty faith. How often do we miss this victory that God wants to give us or this having this experience, this life that God wants to give us because we give up too easy? We let our circumstances pull us away. We let people shouting at us deter us. We get too frustrated or defeated and we let that overcome us instead of sticking with what we know about God and who we know Him to be. He gave you a spirit of grit. That's what He's given you. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. You have a spirit of power in you and nothing else. He's given us that. Jesus came and experienced all of that temptation so that he could help us. So not only did he give you a spirit of grit, he gave you someone to help you in your moments of weakness so that you can be strong in him. So don't let anybody tell you otherwise. And keep asking and keep pursuing and keep believing in who God is despite what's going on around you. And don't be so picky. Don't be so picky. This woman could have showed up and said, don't give me the crumbs. I'm only going to take what you would give to the children. And she could have argued with Jesus about it. But at no point does she argue with Jesus. She is going to be satisfied with whatever he gives her. Let's rejoice in the victories that God gives us no matter how he gives them to us. Let's be thankful for the blessings God gives us and extends into our life, no matter what they look like. Let's not be so picky. Let's be satisfied with the crumbs from God's table. Let's let's not have to be perfect in all of this. Let's take what God's going to give us and rejoice in that. Because whatever God is going to give us, whatever God gives you, is enough. It's more than enough. It can heal a demon-possessed daughter. It can forgive us of our sins. It can give us new life. It can give us freedom. It can give us victory. Let's have a gritty faith that pushes through all of these obstacles, even our own expectations, and just trust that God's going to do what God's going to do, and that's going to be enough all the time. 
That's gritty faith. Gritty faith led to the victory for this woman's daughter. And it's gritty faith that's going to lead to our victories in our lives today. So even when when we feel like God's not answering, even when we feel like God is silent, let's push through. And let's have some grit. And let's just wait for God to give us the victory that we already know he's guaranteed us. Amen? Lord God, we thank you for this woman's story. We thank you for the grit that she displays in her life and the determination that she has in her pursuit of you. God, give us a little bit of that. Give us a little bit of that grit. Give us a little bit of that persistence and passion. God, we know who you are. We know that you are Lord. We know what you have done on the cross for us. We know what you have given us in your spirit. We know the power and the authority that you have. We believe these things. We know that the circumstances around us might try to convince us otherwise, but God, we stand true and stand firm on who we know you to be. You are Lord. You are Messiah. You are our helper, our salvation. God, we are more than conquerors in you today. God, help us to live today and every day in that faith and standing firm on that foundation. And God, we will just happily receive whatever it is that you want to continue to extend to us through your grace. God, have your way with us. God, help us to be a people of gritty faith. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up and praise it, man. When I walk through the battle, you see my victory. I see the mountain, you see a mountain move. As I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every year I lay at your feet. God, I'll see through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. If you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. Nothing can stop.
stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty oh, for. 